This is Blaine Reed, IPM agent in Hell, Swisher County, and with me is Dr. Sue Hasfahedi, and together we are going to go through uh, cotton agronomy and cotton pest here on the High Plains. It's going to be an introduction for things to scout for, but also to talk about uh, how this cotton goes from this little seed all the way through the uh, summer to, to reach the end point of actually cotton in, in one season. Uh, you know, it is kind of amazing that cotton is a tree, and uh, there are several species of cotton. The main one we grow here is Gossypium hirsutum, but it is a tree, and there's a lot of little tricks we do to get that tree to make cotton in one summer, especially on the high plains with a shortened growing season. And we've got a lot of pests that will attack at different stages. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Suhas and I are going to go through this uh, uh, introduction to scouting cotton here on the High Plains. Now, be before we learn how to scout cotton, it's important to know why do we scout. I think the most important thing we can do during the season is having a good scouting program in place. It helps us spotting the problem if there is any and identify the problem. And based upon that, we can take the proper decisions, management decisions if needed. In, on this slide, you can see there are two different sting bugs. Both look same, those are brown. But one of the sting bugs, the one with the pointed shoulder, uh, shoulders, that's a beneficial sting bug. We don't want to spray a good guy. And that's why the scouting is very important. It helps us to spot the problem and identify the exact problem in order to take a proper management decision. So starting on uh, with agronomy, of course you have to have a plant before you can have insects out there. And cotton is unique being a tree. It will start off as a seed that goes into the ground. Um, you know, growers will take care of a lot of this, but and we do have pests that will attack it as soon as that seed hits the hits the field. But when the conditions are right, this little seed will take a, intake water, and something a little bit magical will happen. It will uh, sprout a radical, the taproot, and it will reach down deep enough and start to anchor itself. And then this cotton plant will then pull its cotyledon leaves out of the seed coat and break the ground. That's fairly complicated. It is a tree, and it. Cotton is, is somewhat unique, and it, that's why a lot of people will have trouble getting cotton stands. Environmental conditions have to be just right. Can't have too thick of a crust. Uh, Cast has enough moisture. Can't have too much moisture. Can't go in, in mud. So cotton, it, it's a little bit complicated, but uh, that's how it starts off, literally with that radical uh, anchoring itself down and then pulling what we call the cotyledon leaves free of the seed coat, leaving the seed coat in the ground. Which, by the way, a lot of our insecticidal seed treatments are on the seed coat and they should not always but should be left in the soil for the roots to uptake that insecticide later that'll be an important uh, thing to uh, make note of in the first few weeks now the cotyledon leaves those were something that were packed inside the seed back when that seed was in a bowl before uh, the radical everything to make that little plant was packed inside that seed coat and uh, as those cotyledon leaves were, like I say, pre-packed, and as soon as they emerge from the ground, that plant is ready to start photosynthesizing right away and start making its own uh, food and then developing new cells. See, everything that we see on the cotyledon were in the seed. When we start seeing right here in this middle area between those two cotyledon leaves, it's called the apical meristem or the growing point. That's where all the new cell development's going on. Of course, there's plenty going on below ground, too, with uh, roots going out from that taproot, looking for water and nutrients to uptake. But right here in that middle area, that's the growing point. And you see on this uh, next picture down, we see that terminal, that growing point, with a new leaf starting to form there just days after those cotyledons come up and it started with that uh, food production. Now, when we start talking about stages of cotton, this is really important. So we have the cotyledon leaf after that uh, plant quits pushing and it's up and starts photosynthesizing. And in that apical meristem, that terminal, we have a true leaf, not packed inside the seed when it was planted. Actually, new cell development and growth. 
And when we refer to these stages, we talk about first true leaf. When that leaf is completely unfurled and at least the size of a dime, that plant has gone from cotyledon stage to first true leaf stage, which these leaf stages are actually very important to growers to know uh, exactly which stage they're at in the development of their plants. And we can get into that a little bit more, but we'll talk about first true leaf. Now, when it puts on that second true leaf, it's pretty simple. Second true leaf stage, third true leaf stage, fourth true leaf stage. A lot of our um, timings of uh, herbicide applications, um, fertilizer, or even insects that are um, going to be attacking the plant and what it's susceptible to are all based around this first, second, third, fourth true leaf stage. Now, cotton varieties vary, and environmental conditions vary quite a bit, but at some point between the fourth true leaf stage and the ninth, usually around the fifth to the seventh, that plant starts going into reproductive mode which means it's kind of going through a little bit of puberty, if you will. It starts putting on some squares. I don't know why they call them squares because they're triangles, but they go into reproductive mode. And you can kind of tell that in this bottom picture when that leaf, that true leaf shape starts to change. It starts to grow a little bit more like a tree leaf on those true leaves. And it starts putting on different vegetative and reproductive branches that will branch out on this tree that we'll see later. And uh, we see that cotton developing along the way. And that, of course, comes up with our terminology that we deal with. At every true leaf, we are going, that's referred to as a node. And the length of that plant grows up from that growing point uh, in between the nodes where those true leaves and the vegetative and reproductive branches are is the inner node area. That'll be pretty important just the terminology. It'll help us later as we come through and plant map for fertilizer and PGR needs and uh, how that, that's going. But uh, this is uh, how you measure that. Now, if a hailstone comes along and rips off a true leaf, does it change its leaf stage? The answer is no. Uh, that Even if that leaf is completely ripped off and gone, you can still see the node where that true leaf was. So if a plant surviving a hailstone has all the leaves ripped off of it, but it has four nodes, that's still a fourth true leaf plant. It's just been set back a little bit. So that's how you, you'll, you'll keep that up with uh, the nodes and inner nodes there uh, for, for the uh, cotton. Now, this, turn it over for the insects that will be attacking this early season. And I'll turn that over to Sue Huss. Well, d during the season, one of the common terms you would hear is heat units. So what are heat units? Heat units are calculated by taking the average of day's maximum and minimum temperature and subtracting the threshold temperature, which is 60 degree Fahrenheit for cotton. It means that's where any growth happens, or that's the minimum temperature we need in order to have any kind of growth in cotton. So for example, if we have maximum of 90 degrees and the minimum of 75, we take the average of that and subtract 60 from it. In that case, we would have around 22.5 heat units accumulated for that day. On an average, it takes about 50 to 60 heat units for a plant to reach from seed to seedling stage or the emergence. So what kind of insect pests uh, can we expect during uh, the time frame of emergence to squaring? Well, here on the high plains, the two major insect pests we see are thrips and wire worms. Thrips are very common insects. Almost 100% of our fields would have some level of thrips infestation there. Wire worms, it's not that widespread, but something, uh, an issue that is on the rise in several spots on the high plains. So what are wire worms? Wire worms are the immatures of either duckling beetles or click beetles. And there are several species of these beetles. And these are the immatures or the wire worms. That's what causes the major damage, not the beetles. Here you can see the pictures of wire worms. If you, under the high infestation, if you dig the soil around plants, there is a good chance you will spot these wire worms in there beneath the soil. Another picture here, you can see those wire worms and the kind of damage. They chew on the growing seedlings there. And as a result, you, you see that spotty or the skippy 
plant stand in the field and that's clearly from wire worms another picture here you can see clear evidence of chewing from the wire worms on those little seedlings or on the stems there all that injury is resulting from wire worms uh, feeding mainly below the soil surface wire worms are kind of hard to scout that's because these worms live underneath the soil and that's where they feed on the plant here you can see there are a bunch of wire worms uh, we, we put them on the soil exposed to the light and they already started to dig themselves uh, into the soil they would hide themselves deep into the soil here you can see a lot of them are getting underneath the soil there and, th and th this is the reason we, we don't usually s uh, see these wire worms on the surface because they are living in, into the ground and that's where they are chewing on those germinating seeds or emerging plants so how do you scout for these wire worms, Blaine? Well, it's, uh, I, I like to come right behind the planter shortly after germination. That's one thing we've been doing here through May in the High Plains is shortly after germination, we'll come through the planter and you guys have all uh, experienced the farmer taking a pair of pliers or a knife or a stick and scratching in, and just loose term, scratching in the planter track and he's usually checking the environment that, that seed has been planted in. I'll do that and we'll find the uh, seedling below ground. I'll take my, my knife or my screwdriver or pliers and I'll uh, actually dig up that seedling and do an evaluation on it. Very rarely where you see, actually see the pest, but you will see the damage and we'll, we'll rate the damage. And uh, if that taproot, the radical has been chewed on, that's a gaping wound that that plant will probably be sick from for all summer more than likely. It's a gaping wound that those uh, seedling diseases that you guys will hear about later uh, to enter almost tenfold the level that they are uh, beforehand. But if they bite the crook or the apical mary stem where that plant comes out and grows, that plant's dead. So really all I'm doing is uh, once we, we're not finding a problem and then solving it, we're seeing a problem that this field is not going to establish we need to replant and take other measures and you guys as field scouts are very likely to see that here in the Hale Swisher area uh, that, that we're going to be scouting in, in the next few weeks you come across a field that's not established we'll talk about it but you guys are going to need to scratch and see is that seed going to come up is it wire worms or something else and uh, preventative measures seed treatments work really well on them so with that I think that's it uh, on the wire worms else. So another common insect you would see during the seedling stage of cotton are thrips. Here you can see there are about at least three thrips you can see into the plant terminal and on the other side you see the kind of damage they do to the plant. They suck the juice out of the plant as a result you see that curling of the leaves early in the season. Thrips are usually a problem during the time frame of emergence till the fourth true leaf stage. Once the plant reaches five true leaves and after after that, thrips won't cause any problem because plants can recover from the injury, whatever injury thrips would cause to the plant at, the, at that stage. Thrips can cause severe damage, especially under the cooler weather when the plants are growing slow, it's hard for the plants to recover from the thrips injury. Seed treatments on an average would provide control for about three to four weeks depending upon the weather and kind of the soil moisture we have in there. And it comes down to the numbers game. How many thrips are there per true leaves? What kind of uh, the mixture if there, there are adults or immatures present in the field? That that's boils down to the decision whether we need to spray the crop or not. If you see just adults in the field, I won't worry much about it. But the moment we start seeing immatures there, it means our seed treatments are, aren't doing the job. Seeing those immatures in the field, it means the reproduction is happening there and probably seed treatments are running out of the juice. And we, we will have to come up with some sort of rescue treatment, which would be foliar application. H how do you scout for these guys, Blaine? 
So our thresholds are based on number of thrips per true leaf. So one, you've got to record your number of true leaves, but it's going to come down to a whole plant inspection, uh, which means us getting down on our hands and knees with pocket knife, knife, turning over each one of these leaves. And in that growing point, those developing leaves that aren't open yet, you've got to unfurl those and look inside. Those immatures, those larvae that he's talking about, they like to get down in there in that real soft tissue. And those thrips, they have that one mandible that they just scrape and rasp that plant so that they won't ever kill a plant but they will set it back as much as two weeks which um, you know in the high plains with our short growing window we can't really afford to lose those two weeks in developmental time so yeah we've got to look every leaf top and bottom and then unfurl those leaves now there's a couple of different methods you could say pluck that seed up but are the seedling up and, and pick it up and, and, and work on it that way but then the wind is going to catch every thrip that's on that leaf and it's going to carry it off. Another method might be to uh, get a said Dixie cup with a white inside and get it close to that plant, pull it up, shake it in there directly and check it. Uh, that That's okay. I tend to do the best when I, with my old knees, walking across that field, get down and, and check at least two plants. If I'm going to get down, I get at least two plants while I'm there and do whole plant inspections and I'll do five to ten stops across the field and I'll calculate the number of thrips per true leaf then. Um, now Suhas in his lab has an excellent way when we're doing research on these where we'll clip the thrips off and they go straight into alcohol and then he'll strain out and uh, in his lab uh, go through and count with a microscope and do species checks. We, we can't really do that in the field but uh, that's uh, yeah. Some awesome work Sue Haas does. Yeah. When we are in the field, there is really no alternative to whole plant inspection. We have to make those whole plant inspection there and track the numbers of uh, how many thrips we are seeing there. How do we differentiate between adults and immatures is looking at those wings. Uh, I don't have a picture here, but on the adult thrips, you would see those blackish uh, wings. On the other side, on the immatures, you won't see those leaves, uh, wings in there. So that's how you differentiate adults versus immatures. But, uh, so, just to sum up, for, for my field scouts, what I'm going to expect for you from the seedling up to the squaring stage is you guys are going to need to get plant stands. There's a minimum number of plants per acre that are going to be economically profitable for irrigated or dry land. Where I'm going to expect that to be done. We're going to need a plant stage specifically what's out there and we're going to need whole plant inspections for the thrips we need beneficial id and it's a great time also to get weed pressure id and help the growers out when they're small so when you come back from a field those are the things i'm going to expect you agents in the room and that are out there i think uh you know you get a phone call those are some things that you're going to want to pick up on too what's the stand like what's the uh, wire worm what's the thrips what's the seedling disease and, and what's the weed pressure so those are things to look for now. Now coming into the fruiting, this is always very, very tough to describe. You now when we talk about those squares and nobody in my 30 years of being in the field sauce has ever been able to, Dr. Coker, maybe you can. Why is it called a square? Square? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've heard that question before. Okay. So I think so. it, it looks, it looks <laughs> to a lot of people, but it's not exactly yeah. a square. So when this square grows up, it's going to be more of a triangle shape. But the very first square that goes on the plant is going to be very, very tough to see. It's going to appear in that apical meristem where you've got those vegetative and reproductive branches. It starts putting in the reproductive branches on we need to keep up with the number of squares kept and dropped right away. And these squares will literally be the size of a pinhead. And I mean the sewing needle pinhead. And we've got to find those squares. Uh, it's very important. Different pests will feed on them. And we part of our thresholds are based on knowing exactly what our fruit retention is. Of course, cotton being a tree thinks it has 200 years to live anyway. It will drop a square if anything at all is wrong with it. Uh, a little bit of wind, a little bit of static electricity. It, it will chunk squares because it thinks it has many years to make them. But we've got to keep this plant happy enough that we've got just three months to make all of this cotton. So here's actually on the top picture there, 
is a uh, plant that's about quarter grown square. And that thing probably has about 10 to 12 squares jumbled up into that mess. It's real tough to see if you haven't seen it before. The middle picture is uh, about a match head squ size square on a reproductive branch. And again, that's if you don't know what you're looking at, that's real hard to see. And I guarantee behind that square are at least two more already on that plant. And we've got to be able to find those and count those. Now, the picture over here on the uh, right, the bigger picture, you see the main stem uh, growing up of the cotton plant and you see a lot of branches, not just a leaf. Where those, those nodes, where those leaves were originally at, you're gonna have a reproductive branch and a vegetative branch. Now I'm gonna step over here away from the microphone, but this is your reproductive branch. Now when this plant was down here about the fifth or sixth leaf stage, that branch looked about like that, or even smaller than this. But already packed on that branch was a first position for any site, second, third, and probably by that time fourth, and this you can see, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seven fruiting sites on that reproductive branch. Now, probably in the high plains, not all those fruiting sites are going to make. It just doesn't have enough time. But the first positions of the first fruiting branches are extremely important. And so we've got to identify and hang on to those quick. So, yes, as the square develops, it'll start here. Here's a match head, quarter grown. Uh, about three quarter grown, it will candle and bloom. And after it blooms, it then becomes a bulb. Now, up close on one of these reproductive, oh, I can't go back, on these uh, reproductive branch, you'll see you've got a, your square, and right here is another square, right behind that. Now, you guys that have scouted for me before, or agents with experience, know there's something wrong with this picture here. What's missing? Okay, so uh, I think we got it right in the hallway out there. Right here is a drop square. You'll tell that you've got a scar where that square attached. It formed an abscission layer and that square fell off. You have protective branches that should have, or, or bracts, that should have been there to protect that square, but for some reason, they're long gone. And this one is actually an easy one to see. When they get small like this, they get a lot harder. So that's why we try to expose you guys to see these things early on before it gets in the field. And because uh, the first ones you see will be the hardest. It'll be fairly easy later in the year. Almost about 80 to 85 percent of the bowls we harvest comes from the squares that are set around four to six weeks beginning of the squaring time. And that's why it's so critical to monitor the square site on the plant. We just don't have the time to make it up. We can make up some, but not very much. Here's a picture of that terminal from above, looking down in. I can see, here's a reproductive branch, square, probably three more there, square, another reproductive branch in the making, square. There's several squares right in there. And looking in close, you can see that terminal growing point and identify the new leaf and the branches and the squares as they come out. So fruiting positions we did talk about, you know, the closest to the stem is first position, second, third, and, and so on. And uh, here's that first reproductive branch. We've seen this picture a while ago. But whilst what I'm looking at here is a vegetative branch. And you see some squares and fruiting sites on that. But don't let that fool you. Don't let that trip you up. That's a vegetative brain. Basically, the plant at that node stage when it was young was not in reproductive mode yet. It hadn't gone through puberty yet. Once it did, it takes advantage of all the fruiting sites it can. Eventually, this will have fruiting sites on it, but it's not the same setup, if you'll notice, with the different first, second, and third positions. It's like a whole other plant growing up the side of the cotton plant, where you've got a whole new terminal, which can be important in case of a hail and you lose your main stem, you've got an alternate growing point, but uh, just just don't be fooled by the vegetative and the reproductive branch. Reproductive branch is basically a single that comes out with the fruiting sites on it. 
there will be a leaf that will be put out beside every uh, fruiting site to feed that fruiting site uh, uh, fairly quickly with energy. Now, once the plant is beyond fifth true leaf, we don't have to worry about thrips or wire worms. During the reprodu reproductive stages of the plant, what we can expect in this area would be either cotton flea hopper or ligus bug. Here you can see the pictures of both on the left side, that's cotton flea hopper, light green in color with several blackish spots all over the body, that's flea hopper. On the right side, you see the ligus bug, which is yellowish orange tinge all over the body, and you see that triangle, that yellowish triangle. That's very distinct to differentiate ligus bug from other, other plant bugs. On the bottom, you see uh, those are the immatures of both cotton flea hopper and ligus bug. In particular, if you look at ligus, you see those five black spots. That's how you differentiate immatures of flea hopper and ligus. The first instars would be very difficult to differentiate, but there you can uh, differentiate that. And how do you do that, Blaine? Well, that's certainly why we're going to arm you with uh, handheld uh, lenses, hand lenses, little microscopes have in your pocket. So when you look at these guys, a flea, cotton flea hopper, it's not a flea. It's a myriad in, in the, the true bug family, uh, Hemitra. Uh, but it's got it that nickname because those hind legs are a little bit flea-like. They're a little bit grasshopper-like, if you will. They're beefed up right in this area. Now the ligus, that first instar, these guys, uh, these guys are teeny tiny. Both of them, the period of a dot, uh, the, the dot period at the end of the center. They haven't developed those spots yet by then, but their legs are more spindly and out. Versus the flea hopper, the hind legs are drawn in. Now they're both plant bugs, why is it important to differentiate? Because the ligus will develop to do 10 times the damage that the flea hopper will. Yep, and flea hopper causes the damage mainly during, next slide, mainly during about three to four weeks beginning of the squaring time. Once the plant is beyond that, we don't have to worry about flea hoppers, but the ligus, it can cause the damage until late in the season. Here you see again the pictures of the flea hoppers, they mainly suck the juice out of those developing squares. As a result, those squares would drop out of the plant. And here you can see the picture of a missing square there. And again, remember most of the yield that we're gonna get at the end of, end of the season, that comes from the squares that are set during about four to five weeks of the squaring time. And that's when it, this uh, flea hoppers cause the damage. When we scout for these guys, keep the tracks of, track of the numbers of flea hoppers, at the same time, also keep the track of how many squares are present and offset on the, on the plant. In other words, person square set or person square loss. Uh, any thoughts on scouting for flea hoppers? That's, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, early on, uh, when we're doing the whole plant inspection, we'll always do whole plant inspections. But 35% of the terminals, basically 35% of the plants infested with a certain percent of proven square drop. Flea hoppers, and like as cotton is not their first preferred host. Mm -hmm. So they can move into a field and move out of a field. So there will always be a certain percentage and it's up to us scouts to catch and figure out what level we're at, both at damage proven done to the plant and pest in the field. Yeah. Next slide. Here is the picture of ligus again. Uh, look at those black spots on the immatures and, and that yellowish triangle on the adult of ligus. They have the piercing and sucking mouth part. They would insert the syringe-like mouth part into developing bowls or squares. As a result, on the bowls, on the external side, you, you would see those black spots. That's a very typical sign of ligus feeding. If you cut open those bowls, there's a good chance you will see those bowls rotting after some time. And, th th and th that's the kind of damage these ligus books do. Again, when it comes to scouting, uh, there are different techniques we can use. Uh, it's important to keep track of how many numbers of ligus we have, either uh, numbers of uh, 20 or uh, 100 uh, sweep nets, if we are using the sweep net for scouting, or numbers of ligus bugs per, per, per drop cloth out there, if you are using those drop cloths for scouting. How, how do you scout for these guys? Well, we always do the whole plant inspections, and when the plants are small, we have to do it in percent term. But once that plant gets some size to it, say about quarter grown, I prefer the drop cloth. You will scare off a few adults, but you will always catch the nymphs. Now, I always also always have a sweep net with me. 
uh, when I go to the field in case I've got square drop that looks like Ligus or flea hoppers and smells like it and I'm using a drop cloth I know I could be scaring off the adults I'll double check that field with a sweep net and usually I'll find the adults that have been feeding I was just scaring them off by the drop cloth so there's different methods uh, for our research plots we use the beet bucket you could also do that in the field that's an absolute put a plant in a bucket and literally beat it and everything that's on that plant comes off if you're there quick enough with the bucket over the top you'll catch the adults in the nymphs too and when we say drop cloth it's just a piece of cloth that we spread uh, between uh, plants in, in the rows and we beat the plants on the drop cloth there and count the numbers of uh, different insects all right so again during the mid to late season these are the insect pests we can expect to see in the non bt crop, uh, we may see some lupus or army worms, some beta army worms, falls or boll worms. Boll worms would be the most common worm uh, we may see during the season. Uh, we know there is uh, some level of resistance to bt technologies in boll worm populations, so be on the lookout for those boll worms, even in the bt fields there. So again, it, uh, during this time of the year or the season, we would see some worms, cotton aphid, and Ligus bug continues to be something that we need to look out for until late in the season. Now the flea hoppers aren't on this list once we start seeing blooms in the cotton field. Well, the, the flea hopper only cares about a certain type of protein. And the best way to get that protein during squaring is the cotton square. When that plant blooms, it can get that protein from the pollen. And that's actually easier to feed on. And well, they're just like me, they're lazy. They want the all you can eat buffet. They don't want to necessarily have to hunt it. So they'll get that from the pollen. So once you get to bloom stage and you see blooms consistently in the field, the flea hoppers aren't a problem anymore. Yep. The ligus don't care, they're still after the fruit. In fact, after bloom, flea hoppers to some extent become beneficials. They also feed on those bollworm eggs out there. Bollworm eggs are very rich in that protein that they're after. Yep. Next. So yeah, what we're uh, looking for between that, when that uh, fruit starts squaring to, uh, uh, when the fruit uh, uh, from square stage up to uh, bloom, um, you know, early squaring, the plants aren't big enough to do a drop cloth yet, record those plant stage, whole plant inspections all the time, and we're looking for, count the total number of possible squares, so you're counting all the drops, and the number of uh, drops or, or total, so we can do that percent. Uh, that uh, Linus was, or, uh, that uh, Sue also was talking about, and of course beneficials. Now the plants get at least quarter grown stage, we'll have our drop cloth uh, and or sweep net and we'll look for the, those numbers per row of feet. Uh, that, that's really the only difference there. So what's happening in that plant from booming bloom to bowl set? So first day that the uh, square turns into a bloom, it's white. That's considered a white flower. At day two, you can see it kind of turns a pinkish color. Day three to four, that turns a little bit darker red, it's farther along. And after day four and five, that bloom becomes a bloom tag and starts to dry down and plop off. And at the base of that bloom tag is now a little dime-sized bowl that's developing, developing the seed, developing the lint, everything that's important to us uh, for that crop. Uh, just looking at the bowl maturity, you can see how they start. This is typical depending on heat units that Sue has described, you know, four to 24 days to get up to a pretty good sized bowl. By the time you get to that 22, 24 day sized bowl and the size of a quarter, that plant has invested enough into developing of those seed and the lint that it's going to take something serious to knock it off. Whether it be an insect or a hailstone, uh, something that's going to, that, that plant's not going to shed it naturally. Now, until it gets to that size of the quarter, that plant it's going to chunk it for any reason and of course all over that plant because it puts those squares on at a different time it's going to mature those blooms at a different time there's going to be blooms and bowls all over that plant at different stages so we've got to kind of baby that plant till we get to a, a point you can see that bowl development in that top right hand corner you can see packed inside there uh, in this particular particular picture we've got some gel substance and then some firmed up if you look closely, you can almost pick out the cotyledon leaves for the next generation inside that seed there. But that's what's being formed inside there. Now, stage of the plant. So we have first bloom when we see the first bloom in the field. Now we need to start talking about recording nodes above white flower. Very important stage. Different things happen 
at different stages of the plant. You see here in our picture, there are blooms all over that plant. So how do you determine what is the node above white flower? It's always going to be the first position, the uppermost first position white flower on that plant. So not every plant will have that first position, uppermost node above white flower. But the field on average will have plenty to gauge. And we will need to count from that node being zero node up to the uppermost unfurled or the uppermost, yes, unfurled leaf that's the size of a dime and count nodes. So the smaller picture to the left or on the uh, bottom right, where the white flower is, is zero down up to the uppermost unfurled and that would be five. Now what's happening? First bloom usually occurs in the high plains about seven to nine nodes above white flower. Environment, variety, and water availability depend. When we get to five nodes above white flower, that's peak bloom, also peak water use. So we can help the growers out even if we're not finding any pest to spray, just by keeping up with the plant stage and telling them where it's at, we can provide a great benefit. If he knows that the field is averaging 5.5 .5 nodes above white flower, and peak water use happens at five, I better get the pivot running or something like we can schedule some irrigations like that and help them out that way. And it's also physiological cutout. Most parts of the world talk about five nodes above white flower and most of your plant mapping programs, they just consider that cutout. We can't really do that at High Plains. That's almost happens three days after first bloom in a lot of fields. Uh, so, but once it gets to five nodes above white flower, you're probably never going to jump back up to six, seven, or eight. Uh, but also, the longer we can keep it between that five and 3.5, the higher our yields will be up to a point. At 3.5 nodes above white flower, that's absolute cutout. When it reaches that point, that plant will not be able to put on any more squares and have time to make it, to develop them, to make it before a freeze date this year in, in the same growing season. And we actually try to time that to reach 3.5 nodes above white flower to be our last effective bloom date, which is about August 24th for Plainview. It's a little bit later farther south and it's a little less farther north. But uh, we actually try to uh, balance that with, with, with what's happening there. So something else we'll need to get are plant growth regulator measurements, also our irrigation scheduling. We'll take the top five <coughs> nodes and measure down from this growing point, the uppermost unfurled leaf, spot one on that uh, picture to the right, and we can see counting down from that top one, not zero like the nodes above white flower, but this is actually one, counting backwards, two, we see three from above, and on the picture on the left, one is it, but we've got it there, one, two, three, four, five, and we would actually need to measure from this point to that point. And what that measurement is will tell us how what that plant is about to do. See, the plants have the hormones and they will always try to be the tallest tree in the forest as long as they have nutrients available. So if we have <coughs> nutrients available like we wanted to have to have, make plenty of yield, that plant being long-term thinking wants to be the tallest tree in the forest and 200 years from now take over the forest. So it wants long cell division, long internodes, that's not very conducive to high plains cotton. We can't let that plant get above 36 inches or we start losing cotton stripper efficiency and we start getting rank cotton, really an agronomic problem. And it's wasted energy as far as we're concerned. So a plant growth regulator, so while we have ample things for that plant to grow, if we keep that internode level of what that plant's about to do and read that, that area between that, uh, no, first and the fifth note down, we, we can uh, manage, we won't let that growth get away from us. And you might hear some people say, well, if you'll just take your finger and measure between the third and the fourth. If you've got two fingers length, you're okay. If you've got three, you need a PGR. There's something to that, but uh, a more precise measurement is those full five. Now we'll know if you take those uh, top five, and divide by five, whatever your answer is. And if that answer is 0.8, 
that plant's in drought stress. Even though it may not be chunking fruit yet or, or shedding fruit yet, it needs an irrigation or it's about to. Uh, but if it averages more than one, if it uh, comes back a six and that averages to divide by five and that's 1.2, that plant is about to go rank. Put on a bunch of vegetative growth, it has no chance of making for harvest, so it needs a PGR automatically. So that's some data we'll be taking. So again, uh, what what we can expect during this time, uh, the insect space remains the same. Some worms, cotton aphid, uh, fall army worms, boll worm, and ligers. Next. Here you can see uh, there are pictures of different stages of boll worm. Uh, you may see some color variation in boll worms. There are some dark brown to light yellowish or greenish boll worms. Those are all same species of uh, worms. We call that cotton, uh, cotton boll worm or corn ear worm in corn or sorghum head worm in sorghum. It's the same species. You also see that little barrel shaped white egg there. And in the bottom, uh, you see that that's a boll worm moth. Uh, that's what lays the eggs, uh, boll worm eggs onto the plant. Most of the time, uh, it's you will see those little eggs into the plant terminals on the leaves or stems, but it's not uncommon to find those eggs even into the lower canopy of the plant. So when we scout for these guys, keep track of numbers of worms as well as numbers of uh, those little eggs on the plant. Next. Our scouting techniques for boll worms are based upon uh, numbers of worms per acre, or you can count numbers of worms uh, for certain uh, feet. Uh, row feet in there. At the same time, I would also keep track of the percent fruit damage. If I look at 100 bowls and if I see about five to six bowls damage from these worms, that's the threshold. Six percent fruit damage is also uh, an action threshold for bowl worms. On the other hand, if we hit about eight to 10,000 worms per acre on an average, that's also a threshold. That's when we take a decision to spread the crop either based upon numbers of worms per acre or percent fruit damage. And this is the kind of damage these boll worms do to the developing squares or um, fruiting structures or those bowls. It's also very common to find those worms uh, into the bloom tags, which may be on the ground. So when we scout, make sure we are looking into those uh, bloom tags as well on the ground. How, how, how do you scout for these guys, Ben? Well, scouting for boll worms, that separates your scouts that are there for a paycheck and your scouts that are there to really do their job. They'll separate the good scouts from the bad ones. As Sue I said, those eggs can be found anywhere from the top of the plant to the bottom of the plant. And we're doing whole plant inspections and they are very small. Uh, they can be inside the blooms or, yeah, once upon a time, the textbook said 75% would be in the upper third of the plant on the top leaves. You can't really say that anymore. Yeah. They'll be in the inside of blooms. So we'd look at plant top to bottom. So we're still doing the whole plant inspections. Not only that, but oftentimes you see the, the top right picture, that bloom tag fell and that's on the ground. And you've got to go under the plant and pick up all the fruit that's fallen off that plant and search it for bollworms as well. I do do the drop cloths, but you can't use that alone. Um, you're you're going to miss quite a bit. For one, you're not going to find any eggs that way. Um, and so it, it's really a whole plant inspection and the plants are getting quite large now, 20 to 36 inches tall. And I'm still getting down on my knees and we're counting two plants per data set. Mm -hmm. We'll do the drop cloths and they will probably confirm what we're seeing on the whole plant inspections and maybe allow us to do fewer whole plant inspections if we get that confirmation. So we're not out there in a field for six hours getting an absolute data. Yep. That'll help us speed things up, but we can't get away from the whole plant inspections. There's no substitute on bollworm checking there. Yep. So when I scout, I just divide the field into different uh, four different sections, and I would go into each and every section and get certain numbers of uh, whole plant inspection. I would say I, I would look at three to four adjacent plants, top to bottom, count numbers of fruiting structures, percent fruit damage, and how many worms are present, and do that into each and every section of uh, those four sections of the field multiple times and take, uh, then take an average of person fruit damage and numbers of worms per plant or per acre. Now for you agents out there that may not be scouting fields all the time, when we're doing our whole plant inspections for my crew, we're looking for all insects, not just bollworms. You guys get a call about bollworms, well, um, Dr. Uh, Kern, David Kearns, our, our boss, uh, state IPM coordinator mm -hmm. and assistant department head in entomology, 
has developed the, the new threshold for bollworms, and that's 6% damaged fr harvestable fruit that Sue Oz mentioned. If you guys step into the field and all you're worried about is a down and dirty bollworm count, uh, cordon things off like Sue Oz just described and look at 100 pieces of harvestable fruit in that area. And if that is six out of 100 or more are damaged, then that, that's threshold for bollworm. And what's harvestable fruit on July 4th what everything that's going to make is different than September 1st. So on September 1st, if that plant's still putting on some squares, you can kind of ignore it. That'll never make. But anything that's harvestable by that year, uh, 100 in an area, 100 in an area, that's a down and dirty, just bollworms only kind of kind of deal. Uh, but it's it's not that quick. You're you're still spending ample time out there. And uh, we did the math. Uh, I did it. I think Sue House we separately did it. The math on the thresholds versus one method versus the other, they equate to the same thing very, very close. So whichever method you need to use, use it. Yep, next. Uh, so this is another worm you may uh, find in the field, fall army worm. How do we uh, differentiate between falls versus um, bowl worms? If you look at the fall army worm, you, you would see those uh, dark stripes along the body, that's fall. You would also see these uh, four spots onto the eighth uh, segment, abdominal segment of the fall army worm, which is absent in bold worm. Also, I would look at these uh, black spots and in particular these hairs, which are uh, more uh, present on the bold worms. One way uh, I, I uh, use uh, to differentiate falls from bold worm is to look at this inverted Y-shaped structure on the head. That's uh, more distinct in case of fall army worm. In case of bowl worm, it's not that obvious. It's there, but it's more distinct in case of fall compared to bowl worm. And that's how you differentiate between bowl worm versus fall army worm. W why it is important to identify the species? Again, it comes down to uh, the response of those populations to different insecticides. Maybe one species may react to particular different uh, particular insecticide in a different way than other species. That's why it's important to know what species is present out in the field in order to take those proper management decisions. A very common, another insect you may run into is Conchuola sting bug. There are different species of sting bugs, green sting bugs, brown sting bugs, but in our area, we have this black and uh, with that orange tinge around the body. Those are the Conchuola sting bugs. What they do, they have again uh, syringe like mouth part, piercing and sucking mouth part. They would insert their mouth part into those developing bowls. As a result, you would see those black spots uh, on the external side of the bowls. If you cut open those bowls, there is a good chance you will see that uh, whitish uh, wart like structure into, onto the inner side of the bowl. That's a very typical sign of sting bug feeding. Uh, in the future, uh, if the sting bugs are there and the pathogen is present, you would see those uh, rotten balls resulting from the sting bug feeding. When we scout for the sting bugs, again, uh, it's important to do the whole plant inspections and also keep track of numbers or the percent of fruit damage, internal fruit damage. Our thresholds for the sting bugs are based upon what percent of the internal damage we see out in the field. Uh, some of the guys also use uh, threshold based upon numbers of sting bugs per six feet row. That would be about one, one sting bug per six feet uh, of the row on an average. Next, cotton aphid, another very common insect. Uh, in fact, we had uh, outbreak last year in some spot. So during the outbreak years, uh, you would see hundreds of these cotton aphids, mainly on the plant terminals and slowly onto uh, other uh, other plant parts throughout the plant canopy underside of the leaves. You would see hundreds of these cotton aphids uh, mainly under the uh, underside of the leaves. Our threshold uh, for cotton aphid is about 40 to 70 aphids on an average. So when we scout, again do those whole plant inspections, uh, take the leaves from different uh, parts of the plant, <coughs> few leaves from the top of the plant canopy, uh, some from the middle and a few from the bottom and take an average of how many aphids are present on an average uh, per leaf. 
uh, any thoughts on this uh, scouting no. for if it's, it's no. pretty easy to identify no. it's pretty easy they're a secondary pest meaning they don't feed directly on the fruit usually mm -hmm. they're just filter feeding the sugars out of the plant and they can suck the life out of plant in high yep. numbers and, and on the next slide you see the kind of uh, symptoms you would see on the in the field and the way these guys feed is again suck the juice and at the same time they would excrete that honeydew uh, or the sugary solution on the plant. Here you can see those shiny leaves. That's something that is excreted by those aphids on the plant. Very typical sign of aphid infestation into the field. Later in the year with the aphids, if you don't mind, um, if you've got open bowls and if you have enough aphids out there excreting that sugar onto the cotton lint, that's called sticky cotton. They can't run that cotton and mill it very well. So it gets huge discounts. That that's uh, that's where you go into your cheap department store and get a box of socks for five cents and wear a hole in the first day. That was probably sticky cotton, and uh, at least a twelve cent per pound price knock. Yep. So and, they they uh, can they can do that secondary damage like that. And I mentioned the threshold is on an average forty to seventy aphids per leaf, but the moment we start seeing those cracked bowls, the threshold drops down to ten aphids uh, per leaf. That's because that honeydew can reduce the quality of the lint. So what we're expecting from our scouts uh, at, at this stage, from that bloom all the way to absolute cutout, that 3.5 nodes above white flower, record that plant stage with a very specific node above white flower. You're going to need to get an average across the field. We're doing whole plant inspections. We're looking real close for the eggs, worms, and, of course, damage to the secondary pests like the uh, aphids. We're going to calculate the fruit drop, uh, number of lines per row foot on a drop cloth mostly, and of course, uh, bowl worms inspection and drop cloth. To, drop cloth is to confirm what you're seeing in inspections, not to replace it. Uh, any plant uh, measurements, irrigation schedule, and PTR beneficials are always going to be a, a high priority. They can impact and save you from spraying a lot of times. Weed identification, pressure rating, and disease. We're going to be keeping a closer eye on diseases and Terry Wheeler will be talking about that here in a little while but uh, definitely a pressure rating for any disease there. Finishing out the year a lot of you scouts are going to be back in school by the time this hits but for you agents determine your note above crack bowl. When is a cotton field ready for harvest aids or a freeze? Whichever comes first. That's going to be determined by note above crack bowl not to be confused by note above white flower. So you're going to need to figure out what your uppermost harvestable bowl is. So on this diagram, we have bowls above the uppermost harvestable bowl. And what we say, you know, September 1st, what's a harvestable bowl versus it's now October 20th, when our average freeze date is November 1st. How many heat units are we going to accumulate to make and mature that upper crop versus these bowls on the bottom that are already out and are basically exposed to the weather like underwear on a line? Uh, for that fiber quality. So find the uppermost harvestable bowl. And like I say, that will vary depending on what time of uh, year. Find the uppermost crack bowl, first position, and count your nodes up. On that particular diagram, you're looking at five nodes above crack bowl. Uh, with the uppermost, you find that one at that zero. So that was at five. A field is years of research and experience has shown that Four note above crack bowl, that field is ready for harvest aids. Four, maybe a little less, it's okay to have a freeze on it. Those bowls would pop open. So we get, say, September 15th, and we're at four note above crack bowl, and the farmer's ready to go. He's ready to, we can put some pretty cheap harvest aids out there, drop those leaves off, uh, maturing with synthetic plant hormones, pop those bowls open, and get the cotton strippers in the field uh, pretty easy. We're also... Uh, you know, this is going to first open bowls. Another way to look at that uh, is the bowl maturity. Again, you find that uppermost harvestable bowl and you cut into it with a sharp knife. You want a sharp knife uh, because a dull one, when you get sawn through and then you find an old bowl or a young bowl that slices through quick, you slice your thumb pretty good. But uh, you can see the seed developing inside there. If it looks like a boiled egg, that's a one maturity. It's not even close. You slice through it and you've got a little bit of seed development. Maybe just you can barely make out those cotyledons and everything inside the seed. That's a two maturity. And when you get 
a hard black layer on the outside, really hard to cut through those fibers. That's maturity three. When that uppermost harvestable bowl gets to a 2.4 average across the field, that field is the same thing as being four nodes above crack bowl. So maybe you've had a field that's held out and you can't get node above crack bowl, or you need two confirmations, both yes, it's it's node above crack bowl ready, and all the bowls are mature. There's no reason not to do a hard stage, or there's no reason to worry about a freeze catching you early because you're okay. Either either way. All right, uh, that's all we have uh, from this presentation. Uh, I would also suggest you to check out our YouTube channel uh, on the cotton growth, uh, plant growth and development. Uh, that's where we post different videos on scouting techniques for different insect pests uh, from the field. So th that's going to be a very useful resource for you all to see how exactly we do the scouting in the real world out there.